Please copy and distribute this book or video freely. Thank you. The Genesis CAD model. And the word was made 3D. The Genesis creation story has been a topic of debate for centuries. The simple, yet somewhat vague verses describing how the heavens and earth were created has led many to come to vastly different conclusions. Some believe there was a large gap of time between Genesis 1 and 2, while others do not. Some believe the seven days of creation were literal, 24-hour periods, while others believe each day represented a very long period of time. Some believe Earth is millions of years old, while others believe it to be only a few thousand. How can so many reading the exact same text see it so differently from one another? When we look at ancient depictions of the Genesis creation account, we often see a flat earth surrounded by a dome of water. Inside the dome is the sun, moon, and stars positioned in a cloudy sky. Lately a trend is going around by those who still believe in a flat earth. They sometimes use images like these to prove their point. Still others use these images to mock and attempt to discredit the Bible. Although the Bible does not, and I repeat, does not support a flat earth, as you will see, there seems to be some truth hidden in these images nonetheless. We will explore these truths in detail as we move along in this presentation. For now, just keep in mind the waters above and the waters below the firmament of space. These are the key areas to focus on. So which theory is the correct one? Or, does a correct theory even exist? What if someone did have the creation story completely figured out? Would it even be possible for everyone to agree on it? Doubtful. However, that should not stop us from trying. We must keep searching, analyzing, and meditating. We must keep going over the clues we have to see if there is something we may have missed. As mankind's understanding of the universe continues to grow, we must, at the same time, compare what we have learned to the pages of scripture. There may be a surprise waiting for us, a surprise called truth. In the beginning, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1-1. Seems simple enough. We know what heaven is, and we know what earth is. Right? Wrong. The Bible is its own dictionary and its own thesaurus. In other words, in order to truly comprehend what scripture is trying to communicate to us, we must toss aside our preconceived notions of what we think words in the Bible mean. Instead, we must let the Bible define what words truly mean. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2:15. The Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces, or rather verses, are scattered all throughout its pages, and it is up to us to find them all and put them together in the proper order. Once we do this, the Bible will reveal to us exactly what these specific word definitions are supposed to be. Take the word heaven for example. Christians are generally taught that the heaven referred to in Genesis 1-1 is what one sees when one looks up at the sky. But is this true? Is that what is really being said here, or did we just make a huge assumption? What if that assumption was false? Imagine how far off our understanding would be of, not just the first verse of Genesis, but the entire book, if we started off with a completely misleading interpretation. It would be a terrible mistake. Yet sadly, it looks as if this is precisely what has happened. We will now put some of the pieces together to gain a clearer understanding and attempt to correct some of the misinformation that is out there. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12 2. Isn't that interesting? According to this verse, there exists a minimum of three heavens, not just one, which means the ubiquitous interpretation of the heaven mentioned in Genesis 1-1 could very well be wrong. So, what exactly are these three heavens? And just which one of these three heavens is Genesis 1-1 referring to? 
Note that modern Bibles with their often contradictory translations try to solve this dilemma by adding an S in front of the word heaven. In fact, many Christians often quote Genesis 1-1 using the false plural heavens, causing even more confusion when compared to the rest of Genesis and the Bible. See how quickly these false assumptions can pile up? And to have this occur, while still on verse 1 of the Bible, is not a good way to begin. What is even worse is that the three heavens have been interpreted by the modern church with errors as well. Once again, a false assumption has been made that completely throws off the reader from discovering some of the most profound knowledge the Bible has to offer. The three heavens are usually assumed to be, number one, where God dwells, or New Jerusalem. Number two, outer space, and number three, Earth's atmosphere. However, when we read how the Bible actually describes the three heavens, we find that Earth's atmosphere and outer space are in fact considered to be one and the same, which means one of the three heavens is completely missing from Christian doctrine. This is a very grievous error. And because the average Christian is unaware of this missing third heaven, they are lacking one of the most fundamental keys to understanding the Bible. So, before we continue our journey, we must solve this riddle. To do this, we will let the Word of God explain to us exactly what these three heavens are. And by doing so, we can discover the missing heaven once and for all. The Real Three Heavens Paul solves the riddle of the three heavens for us quite easily. The man Paul is referring to in 2 Corinthians 12 2 is most likely Paul, referring to himself in the third person, however, the same could be said for John the Apostle, who was caught up into the third heaven in the book of Revelation. Can you spot the description of the third heaven in this verse? Look carefully. How about a hint? Neither shall they say, Lo here, or, Lo there, for, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17 21. Note that kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are interchangeable. In other words, there exists a heaven within. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make, that which is within also? Luke 11 40. Here we have another clue. Again, Jesus uses the word within, contrasting it to the word without. Without is what the Bible refers to as the macrocosm. The macrocosm is everything that we see around us. Within is the microcosm. The microcosm is that which is within all of us, including the Pharisees. Jesus is teaching an important lesson here. Now do you see it? Paul's verse has a double meaning. The phrase, in the body, reveals what the third heaven is. It is the microcosm within each one of us. Heaven number two is out of the body or the macrocosm. Heaven number one is everything else, which we will refer to as the multiverse. Note that descriptions of New Jerusalem are most likely describing a tesseract, a picture of higher dimensions. This would explain its unusual cube-like appearance. When we add all the evidence together, we find that when Paul and John were caught up to the third heaven, they were in fact caught up into the microcosm, or the heaven within the physical body. With this new important revelation, we can now gain a greater understanding of just what Paul and John were seeing. They both saw the throne of God, which is a picture of a heart. On the throne is a lamb looking as if it had been slain. This is a picture of the blood of Jesus, that pumps through the heart. The four living creatures represent the four chambers of the heart, as well as the four forces of nature that power it. They mimic a perpetual heartbeat by repeating the words, holy, 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 over and over again. Both the heart and blood are surrounded by 24 elders, which are a picture of 24 ribs, matching human anatomy in the kingdom of God within. Before the throne are the seven spirits of God, which are a picture of the lungs and the breath of life that flows through them. Amazing, isn't it? So, why is there a detailed description of a bosom in the book of Revelation? 
and just whose bosom is this? How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. 2 Corinthians 12 4. The third heaven is also referred to as paradise. Thus, the third heaven and paradise are referring to the same thing. But what does all of this have to do with a bosom? Paradise, aka, the third heaven, is Abraham's bosom. This is what Paul and John saw, and what is described to us in the book of Revelation. Something worth noting here is that, contrary to what the church generally teaches, Abraham's bosom was not emptied out when Jesus died. Abraham's bosom still exists to this day and is where the saved are resting until resurrection day. And there we have it. The three heavens, multiverse, macrocosm, and microcosm, are complete and in total agreement with the rest of the Bible. And because they are in order of creation, we now know that the very first heaven that God created in Genesis 1-1 was the multiverse and not the heaven we see when we look up into space. So, what exactly is the multiverse? We will get to that in a moment. Let us first decipher the meaning of the word, earth. Remember, we must not take Bible words for granted. The word earth here is not what most would think. In order to truly understand what the first verse of Genesis is teaching, think of the word, earth, as the word, hell, and everything will begin to fall into place. In other words, in the beginning, God created heaven and hell. Once this connection is realized, the phrase, without form and void, begins to make much more sense, as it is the literal interpretation. Hell has no form and is void. Heaven and hell is what God originally created in the very first verse of the Bible. What we are left to conclude here is that, just as there are three heavens, conversely, there are three hells. There is a microcosm hell to match the microcosm heaven. There is a macrocosm hell to match the macrocosm heaven and multiverse hell to match the multiverse heaven. We will explore all these concepts in depth as we go along. What is hell? My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Psalms 139.15. Previously, we learned that the third heaven is the microcosm, or kingdom of God, within. Compare that to what this verse is teaching. We all know that human beings are conceived and developed in the womb, yet God is teaching us that the womb is in fact the lowest parts of the earth. There is something rather astonishing about this connection. The implication presented here is quite monumental. Unfortunately, most Christians are completely oblivious to it. Why? They are told not to take verses like this literally, as that would reveal too much truth. The lowest parts of the earth is also known as hell. Practically every person on the planet is familiar with this concept. Yet, according to the written word, the lowest parts of the earth is also the place where human beings are conceived and born out of. Isn't that something? This begs the question. If we all come from hell, how did we get there to begin with? A previous life perhaps? And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Luke 16 23. The microcosm version of hell would be where the rich man ended up as he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, or paradise. The two are perfectly juxtaposed to one another. Abraham is representative of the Heavenly Father. A future promise yet to be fulfilled. Our earthly father is something we will go over shortly. By the way, the image on the right is the devil tarot. Notice anything? There is a reason why that devil tarot is shaped like a phallus. Remember, for everything that God has created, the devil has a counterfeit. In our current reality, we experience a combination of both heaven and hell at the same time via the microcosm and macrocosm. Though sadly, the balance is not equal. In addition, hell is slowly corrupting any heaven that currently exists until one day, our entire universe will die. 
Therefore, our goal in life is to choose our next destination. Higher dimensions or lower dimensions? These are pure states. Remember, the rich man was in torments or lower dimensions, while Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom or higher dimensions. Between them is a great gulf fixed so that no one can pass from one to the other. What is this great gulf? Our universe. Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah 1 5. There is something about hell and mankind's existence that the modern church is desperately trying to keep hidden. Something that could help answer a lot of questions, like, do the unsaved really burn forever? Are they really in a place of continual torments for all of eternity? Of course not. God is love, and the bottom line here is that, contrary to what the church teaches, the general concept of reincarnation is in fact very, very biblical. The supporting evidence is overwhelming. In fact, the biblical term for reincarnation is, mystery of iniquity. Now you know what that means. The Genesis CAD Model In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 1. As mentioned earlier, the Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle. Here we see John talking about the beginning of creation. This verse actually puts us before Genesis 1 1. Meditate on this for a moment. In the beginning, nothing existed except words. No universe, no matter nothing except words. And the word was with God, and the word was God. This word of God can be likened to software code. Movies like The Matrix borrowed this idea from scripture. And now, scientists are beginning to make headlines with theories about how we may be in fact living in a type of computer simulation. Did the Bible confirm this thousands of years ago, before anyone could even imagine such a thing? This is the question we will now explore. To help us along, we are going to compare the Genesis creation story to the modern-day concept of how computer-aided design and manufacturing is used to create virtual worlds of our own, and in a sense, how mankind is already playing God within these virtual worlds. Playing God. Why does that sound familiar? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1 1. The multiverse was the very first heaven that God created in Genesis 1 1. Now the multiverse can mean many things such as alternate dimensions, the spirit world, parallel universes etc. Don not forget that, when John saw a new heaven and new earth, technically speaking, he was seeing a parallel universe. Not only that, but he was even transported there and back. Which means we humans could eventually have the capability to travel back and forth between parallel universes, that is as long as God approves of course. Having said that, even parallel universes must have a beginning. And it goes something like this. In the beginning was the computer-aided design software code. Unless one is a programmer, when one typically works on one's computer, one doesn't actually see the code on one's screen only the end result. This is why God the programmer is said to be invisible. Only those with special privileges can access and see the source code. Jesus is one of those, and so is the devil and antichrist. There are many types of design software nowadays to choose from depending on which end result one wishes to achieve. However, they all work off the same basic principles. But what's fascinating is that they all work exactly how the book of Genesis describes the creation story. Observe. Most modern design software uses something called a plane and something called a sketch. Think of the plane as something one would draw a sketch on like a piece of paper, a canvas, or a scroll perhaps. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Revelation 6.14. Note that the heaven mentioned in Revelation 6.14 is being described as a flat scroll that is eventually rolled up, like a curled up dimension, a concept the brightest minds of our generation 
are just now coming to grips with. In the world of quantum physics, this scroll is called a membrane. Some theories suggest that our entire universe exists on a single membrane. These membranes act as boundaries, separating one dimension from another, or higher dimensions from lower dimensions. Perhaps even one universe from another. Notice anything peculiar about this image? And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Revelation 15 2. The sea of glass is a perfect example of a dimensional plane. The sea of glass acts as a boundary between our universe and the higher multiverse. It is the glass dome seen in ancient Hebrew depictions of cosmology. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Revelation 13 1. Another dimensional plane acting as a barrier is the bottomless pit, or in some translations, the abyss. This would be the boundary between our universe and the underworld, or hell. In the Bible, planes are described as a sea, like water. Why? One reason may be because water becomes a perfectly flat surface when still. In the esoteric world, Freemasons meet on the checkerboard floor. The floor represents the perfectly level sea in which Masons meet, on the level. Water has been used as a level throughout history, even to this very day. One type is called a spirit level. You probably own one of these yourself. Notice the name, spirit level. Another reason God may have used the term, waters, may be found in the world of waves and particles. The heavenly plane would represent the wave function, Earth would represent particles. However, these particles have no form as of yet. Quantum physics refers to this as the wave function. In other words, the wave function of the universe has not collapsed yet. More on this later. Does any of this sound crazy? Do not be too quick to judge. Everything we show in this presentation is backed up 100% by the Word of God. To prove this, we will add the testimony of an actual eyewitness to the Genesis creation account. That is correct. Someone was actually there at the beginning and saw everything with her own eyes. The Wisdom Creation Account I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Proverbs 8.23 we now turn to Proverbs, where a feminine being called Wisdom is speaking of the creation, before the earth as we know it was formed. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Proverbs 8.26. This verse puts us at the moment just before the very first verse of the Bible, before the heaven and earth were created. When the word was with God, and, was God. Next, we read. When he prepared the heavens, I was there, Proverbs 8:27. We are now entering the first verses of Genesis. God is preparing to create the three heavens as wisdom looks on. In other words, God is setting up the very first two-dimensional plane of the multiverse. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Did you hear that? A compass? On the face of the deep? Something a drafter, architect, or engineer would do on a flat piece of paper or surface. In a more modern sense, this is something a computer-aided designer would do, using software to place a sketch on a plane. Again, this is describing the very first verses of Genesis, before our 3D Earth as we know it was created. And in an ironic sort of way, it would seem our flat Earth friends may be correct after all, at least in the quantum world of membranes and strings when he established the clouds above. Proverbs 8.28. We have now gone 3D. The firmament of space, or higher dimensions, has now been created. Clouds in this context could be referring to molecular clouds, nebulas, and the first elements of space such as hydrogen. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. 
As God prepares to create the earth, we discover that water was the first ingredient. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. 2 Peter 3 5. This amazing verse teaches that earth was created out of water. This is a very important piece of information that needs to be included in any Genesis creation analysis. Note that these waters could also be a reference to the abyss and bottomless pit. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, Proverbs 8:29. Here, God is gathering the water together before forming the earth out of it. And finally, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. It is here that planet earth was created. How can we tell? Look at the word foundation. Common sense tells us that nothing can be created without first creating a foundation. Planet Earth's foundations were created last in this scenario. This is smoking gun evidence that planet Earth was created much later in the Genesis creation account. Foundations means just that. There is no getting around this fact. What we are about to discover is that the order of creation in Proverbs matches precisely the order of creation in Genesis. Let us go back to the first verse of Genesis and review all of this again with fresh eyes. Once completed, we will have a double witness to the fact that planet Earth was created much later in Genesis than previously believed. The Genesis Creation Account now that we have previewed the creation account through the eyes of wisdom and proverbs, we are ready to turn to Genesis in order to verify that the two witnesses are in agreement. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1-1. As we learned earlier, the heaven and earth being created here are dimensional planes. These planes are like a drawing board that God sets his compass on as he gets ready to draw his first sketch. Again, the Bible refers to the heavenly plane as the sea of glass. The earthly plane is referred to as the abyss, the bottomless pit, and as we will soon see, the face of the deep and waters. In the book of Zechariah, Zerubbabel talks of flattening the landscape into a plane in order to create a new temple. Notice the similarities in how both words are pronounced and how their meanings relate to one another. Plane versus plane. Or, who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Romans 10:7. The deep, in this context, is clearly showing a location where the dead reside. It is a common teaching to view this location as hell. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Psalms 148:4. This is the smoking gun verse that clearly teaches us that the waters above are not clouds in Earth's atmosphere, but rather something that exists beyond the edge of our universe. Remember that ancient Hebrew depiction of the cosmos? The one that the mockers call Yahweh's terrarium? That so-called glass dome is in fact the sea of glass dimensional barrier. The perspective that these images are taken from places the viewer outside of our normal space-time continuum and into the fourth-dimensional spirit world of the multiverse. Angels are described as standing on this surface, peering into the universe inside. And the earth was without form and void, Genesis 1-2. This is the verse that practically everyone that studies Genesis gets wrong. This is not the planetary globe earth that we are all familiar with. At this stage, earth only exists in its original, flat, lower dimensional state. How do we know? Look at the words, without form and void. These words are meant to be understood in their most literal sense. This was the part of creation that would later become known as hell. Remember, we are still in the two-dimensional world of the plane and sketch. Earth has no form at this point. In other words, God hasn't made his first 3D extrusion and thus, hasn't made three-dimensional space. That comes later. In design software, the term without form and void is a perfect description of a sketch that hasn't been extruded or made 3D yet. Earth at this point would exist only as mere random points and sketches. 
a type of chaos if you will. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion, and the stones of emptiness. Isaiah 34 11. Dimension zero would be a point. The Bible calls these points stones of emptinesses. Dimension one would be a line. The Bible calls these lines of confusion. Think of a line that is confused as a string that has not been pulled tight yet, producing random curves or chaos in a quantum soup. This leads us to string theory. One of the latest theories regarding how our existence came to be is called M theory. M theory suggests that all matter in the universe originates from one dimensional objects called strings. These strings neither have width nor height, hence they are quite literally without form and void. These strings exist on what is called a membrane, or brain for short. As mentioned earlier, these brains would be the same as the dimensional planes we have been discussing which the Bible calls waters. According to the theory, the strings vibrate and form the particles that create matter. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet. Revelation 1.10. Think of the strings as words, and the membrane as the paper the words are written on. The strings are often compared to musical instruments. Note that God's words sound like a trumpet. Seems particle physicists have more in common with the teachings of scripture than they realize. Speaking of without form and void, there is a verse in Isaiah using the exact same phraseology as Genesis 1-2. This has caused some to believe that Genesis is describing a recreation of a previous world that was later destroyed. This is generally referred to as either the gap theory or the ruin restoration theory in which God created the heavens and the earth, but something terrible happened and the earth became without form and void. I beheld the earth, and, lo, it was without form, and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Jeremiah 4.23. Although this verse is referring to a future judgment in which our entire universe is ultimately destroyed, the way in which this destruction is described, could easily fit into what we read in Genesis. Specifically, the way our universe is turned back into a scroll or membrane. Back to where it all began with Earth existing as a two-dimensional plane of chaos. Could this be the infamous gap so many are seeing? Could the whole universe, rather than just the Earth itself, be subject to a continual cycle of ruin and restoration? Darkness and darkness was upon the face of the deep, Genesis 1-2, continued. The word darkness has many meanings in scripture. And since it would take too long to cover them all, we will pick a few to study. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1-5. The word darkness in this verse shows that it is the opposite of comprehension, or perhaps the opposite of wisdom. In other words, darkness in this context means ignorance. Another verse about darkness can be found in Job 10.22. A land of darkness, as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness. In this context, darkness is being described as the shadow of death. Note that a shadow is two-dimensional just like a two-dimensional plane a perfect description of the underworld below. The phrase, without any order, is the same as the word chaos, and chaos is exactly how M-theory describes this strange world of strings and membranes. Particles pop in and out of our reality. They exist, yet at the same time, they do not exist. They are, and yet, they are not. And finally, another concept that is very quantum physics in nature, is a state in which light and dark are essentially one and the same. In other words, light and darkness have yet to be separated. That comes later. This is a very difficult concept to grasp, however in the quantum world, this is just the way it is. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, 
whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Revelation 17 8. These strange concepts are found elsewhere in the Bible, such as in Revelation 17 8. Look at the language being used here. Bottomless pit, perdition, foundation of the world. All of these phrases are describing the waters below that separate us from the lower dimensions. And it is here that we find a beast that is both dead and alive at the same time. It exists, yet it does not exist. It is not, and yet is. Quantum physicists call this beast Schrodinger's cat. Can you think of a famous cat in the Bible that is also a beast? That is right. Satan is described as a roaring lion who is both dead and alive. Schrodinger's cat, forever in a state of superposition until one day, the bottomless pit is opened, the gas is released, and the whole world will wonder after the quantum beast who was, and is not, and yet is. This verse is in fact describing the process of reincarnation. The beast was alive, was killed, is now dead, but will reincarnate once again in the future. This has happened many times already, and would explain why the beast has so many heads. Each head of the beast represents another incarnation. The Spirit of God Believe it or not, we are still in Genesis 1-2, where we end the verse, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Common sense tells us that, when something moves in water, it creates waves. However, since the waters being referenced here are not made of H2O, we must dig deeper into the Word of God to find out exactly what is going on in this verse. The word Spirit is an easy one. Most Christians know about the Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is one of the three parts to the Godhead or Holy Trinity. It is said that the Godhead cannot be comprehended by man as it is too mysterious. Do not believe it. God wants us to understand and has made the Godhead quite easy to understand, that is, if one is willing to receive such profound wisdom. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John 5 7. The following information is covered in great detail at mostholyplace.com. In short, the Father represents the neutron, the Word represents the proton, and the Holy Ghost represents the electron, and these three are one, as in the generic construct of an atom. Now, if one finds this notion too outlandish to believe, then perhaps one should read Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. What this verse is stating in plain English is that everything that we see in this universe is made up of tiny little things the Bible calls the Godhead. We call them atoms. God even goes so far as to say that mankind has no excuse for not knowing this. Obviously. Again, it is stated as succinctly as can possibly be. Why the entire world does not know this is quite the testament to how far the wicked ones of this world will go to keep this information hidden from the masses. At any rate, we will assume that the spirit moving upon the face of the water is either the electron itself or a type of pre-electron that is beginning to separate itself from a type of unified field. Interestingly, there is a theory called the one electron universe that proposes that every single electron in the universe is really just the same electron showing itself in multiple places at one time. This seems to be what the Bible is describing, that everything stems from a single Godhead. One of the biggest problems with this theory, it is claimed, is that in order for this theory to be true, we should be able to see anti-electrons, also known as positrons, at the same time we see electrons. In other words, we should be able to see antimatter. In the Bible, antimatter is described as the beast or anti-neutron, the false prophet or anti-proton, and the dragon or anti-holy ghost. So according to scripture, one can see antimatter 
that is, if one finds themselves in the lake of fire. This is where our antimatter friends reside. Physicists say that antimatter moves backwards in time. Thus, the lake of fire is simply an antimatter portal to the past. Those thrown into the lake of fire will find themselves traveling backwards in time to be born again into another physical human body in order to be given another chance at salvation. Again, the mystery of iniquity, aka reincarnation, is biblical. The evidence supporting this in scripture is overwhelming to say the least. Do not be deceived by those that have either not done their research or knowingly twist scripture on purpose to fit their agenda. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9:27. This verse has been used time and time again in a vain attempt to debunk reincarnation. The false assumption here is that the phrase, once to die, means that there is no second death and that once a person dies, that is it. There will never be another death after. This erroneous interpretation contradicts many verses in the Bible. For example, the rapture teaches that many will never die. The book of Revelation speaks of a second death. Lazarus died and came back to life. Elijah and Enoch were taken to heaven without dying. In Ezekiel, a valley of dry bones comes back to life. There are many more examples of those that have either never died or were reanimated after death, only to die at a later time. It should be obvious to anyone. Those attempting to use Hebrews 9.27 to debunk reincarnation are teaching a terrible lie. What this verse is actually teaching is that for every death, there is a judgment. In fact, Hebrews 9.27 supports reincarnation by clarifying what happens to those that are unsaved. They will not be able to come back into this world over and over again without facing punishment. They will be judged and will have to pay a price for their wickedness. While we are still on the subject of particle physics in the Bible, it is worth noting that the standard model of particle physics has been encoded into the biblical text in the form of the high priest's breastplate. The arrangement of the stones follows the standard model precisely. The 12 gemstones represent the 12 particles of matter. There is a great mystery being revealed here that will be covered in a future teaching. We are barely scratching the surface. The description of the four living creatures in the book of Ezekiel and Revelation match precisely with the four forces of nature. The ox represents the strong force. The man represents the weak force, the lion represents electromagnetism, and the eagle represents gravity. The four living creatures also represent the four tribe leaders. Everything is there, waiting to make world headlines one day. As for now, only a handful of people around the world know of these connections. Great efforts have been made to keep this information hidden from the public, and the censorship is getting worse. One should consider themselves very fortunate to be viewing this information because many mysteries of scripture are revealed when one follows these connections. Take the electron for example. We see in the standard model that the electron corresponds to the barrel. When one searches the verses containing the word barrel, one will find themselves in Ezekiel, where the Godhead, the biblical term for the atom, is described in great detail. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them for. Ezekiel 1.18. The eyes round about are electrons. The rings are electron orbitals. Even when looking at artists' renditions of Ezekiel's vision, we can see stunning similarities to artists' renditions of atoms. Armed with this biblical key, one can now decipher cryptic passages that were once considered too mysterious to interpret. For behold the stone, that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes, behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Zechariah 3 9. Since we know that eyes are electrons, we can now determine the chemical element of the particular atom that is being described here. Seven eyes is seven electrons.
In the periodic garden of elements, seven electrons would correspond to the nitrogen atom. There will be a new engraving on these particular nitrogen stones. Scripture is revealing to us that these stones are nitrogenous bases or nucleobases. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The word of God in our very DNA. A new gene sequence is going to be written on them to take away our sins. Hallelujah. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation 5 6. The Lamb is Jesus, who is also the Word of God. His seven eyes represent the nitrogenous bases that will heal us one day. The blood of the Lamb. Holy DNA. The seven spirits are associated with the Holy Ghost. We call the Holy Ghost electron clouds. How many times have you heard about the power of the Holy Ghost electron? Remarkably, these clouds even have a ghostly appearance. Thus, Jesus, representing the proton, cometh in the electron clouds, and every eye will see him as he arrives with the power and glory of the electromagnetic light spectrum. And let's not forget about the Antichrist. His number is 666, or rather, the carbon atom. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Revelation 13 18. When one does a study on carbon in the Bible, one finds that this element absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, corresponds to the mark of the beast. We are all carbon-based life forms, and the mark is transhumanism. Once one takes the mark, their God-given book of life, their DNA, will be rewritten and become property of the beast system. Scripture calls this the unpardonable sin. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost electron cloud that electrifies our bodies and keeps us alive. The newly augmented DNA will transform one's fingerprints and facial recognition features. This is the mark of the hand and forehead. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139 16. Yes, DNA is a book, literally. Tampering with the copyright will reap permanent consequences. We are only scratching the surface of the many wonders that are now rapidly being discovered thanks to these revelations. Nothing like this has ever been allowed to enter the mainstream until now. Why? Because scientific proof of God's existence has always been a topic of controversy. Now that we have it, what do you suppose will happen? The powers that be will not be happy. Do not forget to put on the whole armor of God. A great revolution is about to transpire. The Spirit Brooded We are still in the second verse of Genesis, and the electron at this stage may still be in its one or two dimensional form, as holins and spinins, rising out of the underworld chaos, where light is as darkness. Remember, light can also mean electromagnetism. What about the word, mood? The original Hebrew word for mood is used in two other verses in the Bible. Deuteronomy 32:11 and Jeremiah 23, 9. Let us see. If these verses can help solve our moving upon the face of the waters riddle. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth the broader wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Deuteronomy 32 11. The word for moved here is translated as fluttereth. Who is the one fluttering? The eagle, one of the four living creatures. And now that we know that the four living creatures represent the four forces of nature, and that the eagle represents gravity, we can deduce that the waters were moved by the force of gravity in conjunction with electromagnetism, thus creating gravity waves on a two-dimensional membrane. Not just gravity waves, however, we have also entered the world of waves, or rather, the wave function. Those that are familiar with the double-slit experiment know 
just how strange these waves are. As the Spirit of God moves over the membrane, it causes ripples to appear. The occult world calls this the circumpunct, or point within the circle. The circumpunct is one of the most powerful symbols said to exist. Now, let us look at Jeremiah 23 9. Mine heart within me is broken, because of the prophets, all my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, and like a man whom wine hath overcome, because of the Lord, and because of the words of his holiness. Here, the Hebrew word for moved is translated as shake. Shaking is like a vibration. God is making the strings on the membrane vibrate and come to life. But why relate this to bones? Bones and skeletons are a picture of dead things. Could this be a picture of the dead coming to life? Being drunk is another picture of death or sleep. Could Genesis be a prophecy of something being destroyed then coming back to life? Almost as if being resurrected? As the Spirit of God moves on our membrane, ripples begin to appear. And it just so happens that some scientists believe our universe began exactly in this manner. A ripple was created on a membrane which led to the Big Bang. Is the Big Bang theory supported by scripture? Let us keep exploring. Let there be light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1-3. Light. This is another word we must be careful not to take for granted. In the world of science, light is electromagnetism and the photon. With regards to the four living creatures, electromagnetism is represented by the lion. However, there may be another deeper meaning here. Let us turn once again to the word of God to understand what this light in Genesis 1-3 is referring to. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John 1-5. This pretty much says it all. God is light. This is a concept so many Bible critics get wrong when arguing against the Genesis account, claiming for example, that grass and trees created on day three would have died if created before the sun on day four. How could plants and trees live without light? Easy, God was their light and still is and always will be. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119 105. Remember how that in the beginning was the word and the word was God? Then according to this verse, light, like God, has always existed. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalms 119 130. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Proverbs 6.23. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. Daniel 5.14. Here we see the word light being associated with wisdom, understanding, and God's laws. We can see where the term, illumination came from. So in a sense, one could say that, along with the birth of the multiverse, there also seems to be the birth of a type of consciousness going on. Something that has fascinated many in recent years is the discovery that our universe looks like neurons. It is as if we all live inside a giant brain. Whose brain? Wisdoms perhaps? Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8 12. And finally, we see that Jesus is light, and that light is life. Darkness is death. The world of duality we live in is being formed. Do not forget, we are still in 2D. If we go back to our Genesis CAD model example, the light would represent intelligence being added to the chaotic sketches as we prepare to extrude our model into three dimensions. Think of a drafter or grand architect placing dimensions onto a blueprint. The concept is the same. Day and night. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Genesis 1-4. Since we now have a good understanding 
of what light and darkness is, we can appreciate what is happening in this verse. It is more than just photons and shadows. It is sanity, rising out of insanity. Order, out of chaos. We are literally seeing heaven and hell in the process of being separated from one another out of the single dimensional plane, or face of the deep. In CAD, an animation software, planes have a positive side, above, and a negative side, below. On the positive side, pure light, on the negative side, pure darkness. And, as we will soon see, a combination of both will emerge from between the two called, the firmament. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Genesis 1 5. As we have already learned, light means life, wisdom, awake, sober, truth, order, etc. God summarizes these in a single word called day. The opposite of day would be darkness, ignorance, death, sleep, drunken, lies, chaos, etc. God also summarizes these as well, calling them night. A duality is being formed. Notice the capital letters for day and night? Scripture is telling you to pay special attention to these words as they have much greater meaning than one would initially realize. Notice there is another word day in lowercase at the end of the verse. It has a completely different meaning, a meaning related to a 24-hour period of time, as most nowadays understand it. Now comes the big question. Are we talking 24 literal hours as we know it, or do the six days represent long ages of time? If an animation studio can easily create a virtual world in six days, then God surely can. Do not forget that God created Adam and Eve with age. How could God create a man in a single day that was, let us say, 33 years old? Remember, the rules are different in the quantum world. Things that seem impossible are not. Time as we know it may have been vastly different or even non-existent. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Genesis 1 6. And finally, the moment we have all been waiting for. We have just gone from two dimensions to three. Our virtual simulated universe now has a firmament, aka, outer space, in which we can extrude our 2D sketches into 3D models. The planes, or waters, have now been divided. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Genesis 1 7. The waters above the firmament of outer space is called the sea of glass. The waters below the firmament is called the deep or the abyss in modern translations. The firmament itself is the macrocosm of outer space. Again, the waters above and below act as boundaries between dimensions. We have covered a lot of ground here. Some of these concepts are very advanced and on the cutting edge of quantum physics. A two-dimensional underworld, as well as membranes and dimensional barriers. There is much more still to research. Another meaning of the word waters we have not covered yet has to do with wave-particle duality. At this stage of Genesis, we are still in the world of waves, not particles. Everything exists in the virtual world of the CAD system. Isn't it interesting that the term wave used by particle physicists has the same connotation as the term waters in the Bible? Similar to creating a painting, designing in a CAD program does not necessarily have to follow any particular order of creation. As long as everything is in their proper place when finished, that is what counts. If one wishes to paint happy little trees prior to painting a happy little sun and moon, one can do so. Note that Bob Ross did not have to paint tree seeds and wait for them to grow. He simply painted the trees with age. A similar event is taking place in Genesis. When he prepared the heavens, I was there, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Proverbs 8:27. It is how the design goes from the CAD system, or planning stage, to the real world, that throws everyone off. Remember when God set a compass on the face of the deep? 
The Bible is telling you that God is creating a blueprint in Genesis, not the actual material object. Genesis is describing the simulation creation process. The physical creation, the manufactured product, comes later. According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Exodus 25 9. Just like in the world we live in now, there seems to be a type of design stage first, then the manufacturing process comes next. Scripture calls these blueprints, patterns. Moses was told to construct the tabernacle according to the pattern God showed him in Mount Sinai. Again, God made a blueprint first, then the construction came after. God did not create the tabernacle and all of its furnishings complete and had it magically appear. There were step-by-step -step procedures involved. Eventually the CAD model must be 3D printed or manufactured. Keep this in mind when reading Genesis. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5:12. One of the biggest mistakes just about everyone makes when studying Genesis is forgetting the fact that the six days of creation is not describing the universe as we see it today. The universe God originally created was uncorrupted. There was no death. No sin. No decay. No, we are not talking about the gap theory or Lucifer's flood, we are simply talking about Genesis describing the creation before the fall. Before sin entered our reality. In order for an uncorrupted universe to exist, it had to have been vastly different in so many ways, it would be as if it were another universe altogether. This is the great disconnect we see, and why so many struggle with trying to fit Genesis in with the scientific world we see today. Why would the creation account describe how God created a corrupted universe? That would be an absurd notion. This is not what is being described. Yet, this is what is taught without question. Six literal days? Why not? Grass and trees created before the sun and moon? Sure. Like Bob Ross painting happy little clouds. God can create in any order he chooses and in any length of time because painting a tree and growing a tree are two completely different acts of creation. Once one understands this, the arguments disappear and the answers begin to manifest themselves to us. A type of hologram? A simulation? Perhaps? It was a world without wave-particle duality. That would come later via a most powerful catalyst that was guaranteed to change everything. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Genesis 1:8. As day 2 ends, so does the creation of heaven number 2. This leaves us with one more heaven to create. The third heaven, microcosm. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Genesis 1:9. This is the moment the three-dimensional, globe earth was created. Not in Genesis 1-1 as is often taught. And here we see that planet earth was created originally from waters. Note that the waters here could mean the abyss and the deep. As well as literal waters of H2O. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw, that it was good. Genesis 1:10. Earth is now ready to be planted with the microcosm of life. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, upon the earth, and it was so. Genesis 1:11. And there it is. The third heaven is the kingdom of God within. It is often compared to seed, as well as people in general, like kings or the ten virgins. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was referring to this third heaven. Think of how many times the word fruit is used to describe children in the Bible. There is something very important being taught here. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Genesis 1:13. With the completion of the third day, 
comes the completion of the three heavens. And look how easy it is to remember them. Heaven number one is created on day one. Heaven number two is created on day two, and heaven number three is created on day three. Simple and beautiful. It is almost as if the word of God is trying to tell us something that we may have missed. There is something about the third day and life rising that sounds familiar. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 4. That is it. Jesus rose on the third day. Could there be a link between Jesus rising on the third day and the third day of creation? Could there be more to the story? Two creation accounts? It is well understood that, when one compares Genesis 1 to Genesis 2, one finds that there are in fact two versions of the creation account. However, there is much debate as to whether these two stories agree with one another. A casual reading of the text seems to indicate that the two creation accounts are contradictory. For example, in Genesis 1, God creates plants first, then lights, fish, birds, then finally, man and woman last. In Genesis 2 however, God creates Adam first, before any other form of life. After Adam is created, God then begins to create plants, animals, and finally woman. But is this what is really being taught here? Let us take a closer look. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Genesis 2-4. This verse sets the context of the second creation account by providing us with a specific day in which to reference from. That day is when the earth and heavens were created. If we go back to Genesis 1 to determine which day that was, we find that it was the third day when God called the dry land, earth. This was the moment before any plants, trees, or life of any kind were created. Genesis 2 continues by making this fact clear. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Genesis 2 5. Again, we are at a point in time when no plants existed, which means that there was no life whatsoever on earth. In fact, rain had not existed yet. And of course, there was no man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 2-7. God creates Adam as the very first life form. In other words, similar to what happened to Jesus, man rose on the third day. But wait, aren't we told that man was created on the sixth day? Let us look at that verse. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Genesis 1:27. This famous verse is indeed found on the sixth day of creation. So, which is it? Was man created on day three or day six? Clearly, we have a contradiction here. Or do we? In order to resolve these contradictions, several proposals have been put forth. One method is to simply say that the Bible is in error. Another method is to say that the two creation accounts were written by different authors or were told from different perspectives that should not be compared or combined with one another. Some attempt to resolve these contradictions by teaching that differing races or classes of humans were created each having a specific purpose. The most popular resolution is to teach that the plants and animals created after Adam were made specifically for the Garden of Eden. The word field, it is said, refers to cultivated plants and livestock. This is not a bad interpretation, however, in order to make this theory work, some tweaking of the text is necessary. In Genesis 2 4, for example, the definition for the word day must be changed from meaning a single day to now meaning all six days of creation. In addition, when God created just the earth and heavens as the verse clearly states, what God should have created was everything including all plants, 
animals, fish, birds, rain, etc. This is quite a huge change from what is written. Some commentators, such as Albert Barnes, agree that these verses are indeed referring to the third day of creation. Evidences such as this prove that modern interpretations of Genesis 2 may in fact be an error. There is one more way in which we can resolve the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 contradictions. And that is to simply state that both man and woman were created twice. Not as two races or classes of humans, but rather as a couple who later died after eating a forbidden fruit. It is this original man and woman that had to be recreated in order that the human race as we now know it could continue. The first creation of man and woman occurred before the fall. The second creation of man and woman occurred after the fall. But how can this be? Adam's first wife, no it wasn't Lilith. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Genesis 2.23. Adam's first wife was named Isha, her woman, in modern translations. Yes, you heard that right. Adam had two wives. The first was named Isha, not Eve. Nowhere in Genesis is the word Eve found until after the fall. How is this possible? Remember what God told Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day, that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2.17. There is that word day again. And rather than simply accepting the literal interpretation of it, the church once again has decided to twist the meaning to obscure the truth. The word day now becomes hundreds of years. Is. The claim is that Adam and his wife didn't physically die until hundreds of years after the fall. That brings us to the next modification to the original text. The phrase, surely die, becomes, kind of, sort of, but not really die, or as it is usually taught, they spiritually died, which is really just a cop-out and a completely made-up statement to hide the fact that the church has been teaching a falsehood for thousands of years now. What is this falsehood? That the literal interpretation is not the correct interpretation. But what if it was? What if we simply let the word of God be literal in this case as we should? Day means day, and surely die means surely die. Now everything becomes perfectly clear. Adam and Isha died the very day they ate the forbidden fruit. And it was not just a watered down, so-called spiritual death, whatever that means, but it was an actual, physical death. Adam and Isha died. Totally and completely period. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3 6. This is the moment that Adam and Isha physically died. Did God lie? No. But because the church has refused to take the literal interpretation, the very next verse has become one of the most confusing, mysterious, and hotly debated topics in the creation account. Let us read it together. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Genesis 3 7. In order to understand what this verse is teaching, we must look at similar concepts in the Bible and compare them. There, we will find the missing pieces of this puzzle. We will start with the opening of the eyes and look for something similar in Scripture. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12:2. Adam and Isha's eyes were opened because they had just been resurrected. We know this because that is what eventually happens to everyone who dies. Unfortunately for Adam and Isha, this was the resurrection of the damned. That is to say, for the unsaved. Adam and Isha are about to be judged found guilty, and thrown into the lake of fire. So what does the word naked mean? Is it simply a matter of not having one's pajamas on? Again, the word of God will teach us the meaning. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. 
2 Corinthians 5 2. Adam and Isha were naked because they were not clothed with an earthly tabernacle body yet. That would come later, when God would recreate new bodies for them to inhabit. Along with these new bodies comes a recreated universe and a recreated earth. The 3D printed version we exist in now. More on this in a moment. Judgment Day. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Genesis 3:16. Fast forward to Judgment Day. Adam and Isha have just been resurrected and are now facing judgment. Isha's punishment consists of being born again into a new body. Not a glorified body, but a corrupt one. In her new body, Isha will now experience pain and sorrow. In addition, Isha's new body will now contain anatomy designed to produce children through conception and labor. Prior to this, a man was made from the dust of the ground, and a woman was made or cloned from the rib of the man. In other words, genetic engineering would no longer be the method of reproduction. A deal with the devil had been made, and now God is fulfilling this agreement by recreating man in the image of the serpent, earthly father, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, earthly mother. That is who God was referring to when he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We are made in the image of all three. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Genesis 3:19. Adam received a new body as well. No longer would things be easy as it was in the simulation. Game physics are now in effect. The player no longer has access to God mode, and one life is all one gets to play with. No do-overs, at least not with the same body. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Genesis 3:20. We have now arrived at the moment when Adam gives his new, second wife a name. Eve. And although Adam has been recreated as well, his name stays the same. Now it is important to note at this point that Adam and Eve are in fact the reincarnation of Adam and Isha. They are the same spirit that are now inhabiting new, albeit corrupt bodies. And because there are no earthly mothers to be reincarnated from, God had to manually clothe them himself using flesh and blood. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. Genesis 3:21. Contrary to what the church often teaches, nowhere in the Bible does it say that animals were killed in order to clothe Adam and Eve. Again, God clothed Adam and Eve with the skin we have on our bodies today, and flesh and blood. Listen to what Job has to say. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Job 10:11. That is the real meaning of the word skins in Genesis. And with the reincarnation process nearly complete, the only remaining step is for Adam and Eve to pass through the lake of fire. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3:24. This is what scholars call, Bible topology. This is an Old Testament verse describing a New Testament prophecy. And that prophecy is concerning the lake of fire. Those that are thrown into the lake of fire, pass through it, in order to become reincarnated into their next life, as well as pay off their accumulated debt. Similar to the concept of karma, this is what the purpose of Judgment Day is. To determine the proper sentence, to be carried out for the sinner, to pay off in their next life. To reap what they have sown. Wave Function Collapse and the Big Bang for those unfamiliar with wave functions and how they collapse, the following subject matter may be a bit challenging to follow. A good starting point would be to go to YouTube and learn about the double slit experiment and its implications. Dr. Quantum has a great video for beginners. Also, the term wave function collapse is hotly debated 
as to what it means and whether it even occurs in the first place. It all centers around something called the measurement problem. It is one of those chicken and egg enigmas. A paradox, like Schrodinger's cat. Here are some competing theories from Wikipedia as to how the wave function could collapse. As one can see, there are many to choose from. We will focus on the many worlds theory and the consciousness causes collapse theory. Both will be compared to scripture. Many worlds theory. As the name suggests, the many worlds theory proposes that there are virtually infinite parallel universes that are continually being created and that anything that can happen does happen. Take the story of the Tower of Babel for instance. Scripture tells us that our entire planet was of one language. There even seemed to be a type of world peace as everyone teamed together to create this structure. Then something very unusual happened. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 11 9. The language of the entire planet was confounded. According to the many worlds theory, in order for an event like this to occur, there had to have been many worlds or parallel universes that existed, all with their varying languages, that somehow merged together into a single world, our world. As we learned earlier, John the Apostle traveled to a new heaven and a new earth, literally a parallel universe. John even came back to tell the tale. John was transported there via a portal that opened up and took him. Could the Tower of Babel have been an attempt to create a similar portal in order to reach into other universes? Some say we are recreating this very event as we speak with massive projects like CERN. Once again mankind is poised and ready to ruin yet another universe in order to reach into heaven and become as the gods. Pay close attention to quantum computers. They are just the technology the elite need to bring the book of Revelation into fruition. Consciousness causes collapse. The consciousness causes collapse theory suggests that only a sentient being can cause a wave function to collapse via the act of observation. In short, nothing exists in particle form until it is observed. Earlier we touched on the one electron universe theory. The man who came up with this idea, John Archibald Wheeler, also came up with his own version of the consciousness collapse theory called the participatory anthropic principle. Wheeler was a pioneer in quantum physics and worked with some of the greatest minds of the last century. He even coined the term, wormhole. Wheeler's theory poses an interesting question. Since we obviously exist in a world of particles, who, or what, collapsed the very first wave function in order to produce the very first particles of our reality. And, when did this occur? A new world order, brought into existence by the mere act of an eye opening. Once again, scripture reveals the mystery. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Genesis 3-7. By partaking of the forbidden fruit, Adam and Isha became the first conscious beings to observe the wave function of the virtual world God had created. And, by doing so, committed one of the strangest, most mind-boggling sins ever. At the speed of a twinkling of an eye, Adam and Isha collapsed the wave function of the entire visible universe. You may have heard of this event. It is taught in schools, colleges, universities all over the world. It is called the Big Bang. That is correct. One of the most important events in the history of our existence. And yes, the Bible seems to support this theory. And when we say Big Bang, we are not talking about Adam and Isha engaging in the act of sex with Lilith and the serpent. This was not a 60s, make love not war acid trip. This was an extremely monumental and profound event and one that is often glossed over as something trivial, as if Adam and Isha took some sort of drug and expanded their consciousnesses. Oh, they expanded it all right, along with everything else God created. Another way of putting it 
Adam and Isha unwittingly pressed the start button on the universe's 3D printing process. Earlier in this study we learned how a 3D model in the virtual world of the CAD system is eventually manufactured. Up until now, all of creation existed in the virtual world, or CAD model if you will. One important step we have not covered yet is how one takes what is on the screen and brings it into real life. And as any engineer will tell you, what is on the screen and what is manufactured are often very different from one another. In the CAD system, designs can be created in a sense, perfect. No corruption. No flaws. Everything works beautifully. However, once a design is manufactured, corruption creeps in. And depending on the manufacturing process, the design may have poor quality, not fit together properly prompting rework, or simply not function at all causing major redesign efforts. If an automobile for example, could be manufactured exactly as it exists in the virtual world of the CAD system, without any flaws or imperfections, without any wear or tear, the automobile could potentially last an eternity. Unfortunately, as we all know, this is not the case. And so, with the collapse of the wave function and the exploding rush of particles that formed our universe, came the death of Adam and Isha. Interestingly, there is a teaching in Kabbalah in which God, called Ein Sof, explodes in a type of self-sacrifice in order to create our universe. Some say this is where the concept of the Big Bang came from. In Lurianic Kabbalah, a being called Adam Kadman, the Universal Man, is said to have been shattered into innumerable pieces or sparks, and the goal of mankind is to therefore put these sparks back together again. Is it possible to uncollapse a wave function once it has become a particle? There are verses in the Bible that seem to suggest this. Angels, for example, have the ability to appear and disappear from our reality. And in some cases, when this happens the same, opening of the eyes theme, is present. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head, and fell flat on his face. Numbers 22:31. When Balaam's eyes were opened, the wave function of the angel collapsed, and he could see it. Interestingly, the donkey that Balaam rode upon was able to see the angel before Balaam, however it would appear that animals may not have the ability to collapse wave functions as the angel didn't fully manifest until human consciousness observed it. Some pet owners claim that their cats can see spirits. This seems to be supported in scripture. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. 2 Kings 6 17. The young man is yet another example of wave function collapse. The horses and chariots of fire were not visible to him until his eyes were opened. What is fascinating about this incident is that Elisha was able to see them first. Could there be such a thing as selective wave function collapse in that some humans can observe wave functions without collapsing them, while others cannot? By the way, Wheeler drew a diagram of his participatory anthropic principle theory to help folks visualize it better. Have you seen something like this before? Those that are familiar with the occult have. It's called an Ouroboros, or a slightly stylized version of one. Was Wheeler trying to tell us something? Now imagine that the tail is the book of Genesis, and the head is the book of Revelation. What if those two books connected right back to one another in an endless loop? The body would represent time. The mouth? Lake of fire. Those thrown into it would end up going backwards in time, finding themselves having to repeat yet another miserable cycle of birth and death, birth and death until finally. They find the escape route. What about you? Is your name written in the book of life? Or will you gaze in wonder at the beast that was, is not, and yet is? Choose quickly. Time is running out. Seed of the Serpent And the Lord God said unto the serpent, 
because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Genesis 3:14. In addition to a corrupted universe, the genetics of all animal life became corrupted, or cursed, after Adam and Isha partook of the forbidden fruit. Notice what is being said here in a very subtle manner. Not only is cattle and every beast of the field now cursed, the serpent has now become the most cursed above all. This is because the serpent in this context represents DNA. Notice the phrase dust shalt thou eat. What is this dust? And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Genesis 13 16. The dust represents seed, or DNA. Dust is genetics. Think of the dust in your home. It is made up of mostly dead skin cells, or DNA. A microbiologist could theoretically take this dust and create a clone. Likewise, when God formed man of the dust of the ground, what he actually used was DNA. This is why Genesis speaks of the seed of the serpent. The serpent RNA strand eats the dust or nucleobases that form our genetics. More importantly, however, the seed of the serpent is not just a specific race of people or a certain bloodline. The seed of the serpent is in all life. When Adam and Isha partook of the forbidden fruit, they also participated in a marriage ceremony. More accurately, an inappropriate marriage. In essence, Adam and Isha married the world, our universe, and by doing so, became one with it. The occult calls this, hieros gamos. It is the opposite of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Revelation 2.12. In Greek, gamos means wedding. Per, may mean pergos, or watchtower, or it may mean with regards to. When combined, we get pergamos, or with regards to marriage. Marriage? To whom? A clue is in the phrase, sharp sword with two edges which represents DNA, the word of God. What would be the opposite of the word of God? I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipa was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Revelation 2.13. Satan's seed is in Pergamos, where the temple of Asclepian is, and where the ancients worshipped the rod of Asclepius, the serpent on a pole, Nehushtan. The serpent on a pole was a picture of RNA and has become a symbol of the hugely corrupt medical profession. Yes, the seed of Satan resides within our very own corrupt flesh. This is a difficult truth to realize. Who can receive it? Antipa was slain by being placed inside of a brazen bull, which was modeled after the ancient god Moloch. Bulls, cows, oxen etc. in the Bible all have a common meaning, and it all goes back to the golden calf. The golden calf in the book of Exodus was Hathor, the Egyptian strange woman. Hathor was the earth mother that represented the womb and the mystery of iniquity. Marriage to the world. The pit. Reincarnation. Are you getting the idea? Seed of the woman. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3:15. It is at this moment that all human DNA became cursed and corrupted. And as we just learned, the seed of the serpent is now part of all human DNA. Born unto sin. It is in all of us in our current fallen state. No, it is not black people, or the bloodline of Cain, or RH negative blood, or whatever else one's ego wishes to perceive. Look into the glass darkly and realize how terribly cursed we all are and how desperately we need a savior. So, what about her seed? A common answer is that this phrase is referring to the future Messiah, or Jesus. Not a bad teaching, however, we should keep in mind that this entire verse could have an alternate meaning. A meaning pertaining to the mystery of iniquity. 
it is quite simple really, but a bit hard to take. Warning. We will be discussing adult themes. No children should be present before continuing. May I present for your consideration the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Yes, we are talking about the literal interpretation of male and female reproduction which is supported by scripture much more than your church will ever admit. And according to scripture, there is a form of enmity between them. We will now go over the supporting verses. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. John 8 44. Many verses in the Bible speak of Satan and the devil being our father. They are discarded as being non-literal because after all, a literal interpretation would reveal truths about ourselves that most are unwilling to accept. However, what if verses such as these were to be taken literally? What secrets would they reveal to us? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Matthew 13 38. If we were to take this literally, as we should, then we must agree that Satan is fathering human beings. And, since no human being has received their glorified body yet, and we are all born unto sin, the only logical conclusion is that Satan is the father of all of the human race. Again, no one is a child of the kingdom in the physical sense until after the resurrection. Spiritually perhaps, physically, no. I have said to corruption, thou art my father, to the worm, thou art my mother, and my sister. Job 17 14. Literal or poetry? Perhaps Job is just being, over dramatic, or perhaps Job is telling us an inconvenient truth. That something happened in the Garden of Eden, that Christians are too afraid to admit to. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. John 8 23. Literal or poetry? Does God mean what he says or not? If God says what he means, then we are from beneath, and that we truly are curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now that he ascended, what is it? but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Ephesians 4 9. This verse is speaking of Jesus descending into the lower parts of the earth, again, another reference to hell. Since the truth of this verse would reveal too much and expose the lies of the church regarding hell, scholars have had to make up yet another lie to cover up the real meaning. They claim Jesus went to hell, to release prisoners who were being held captive by Abraham who kept them in his bosom. Since we know that the lower parts of the earth represents the womb, we can clearly see that this verse is speaking of Jesus entering Mary's womb to be born into this world. Simple and beautiful. Enmity. Let us take a look at the word enmity. Enmity is generally interpreted as meaning violence towards as somebody. While this is true, there is also another meaning to this word that specifically relates to the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman aka DNA in cell biology. Observe. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Ephesians 2.14. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Ephesians 2.15. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Ephesians 2.16. See the common pattern here? Made both one. Make in himself of two, one new man. Reconcile both unto God in one body. We can see that these verses describing enmity are telling a very unique story of two becoming one. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Mark 10 8. This is what enmity means with regards to Eden. It is the process by which the seed of the serpent, earthly father, and the seed of the woman, earthly mother, become one. 
Enmity is conception. This is what God was telling Adam and Eve. No longer would man be created by forming the dust of the earth. No longer would woman be created from a rib. A new process called enmity would take its place. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Genesis 3.16. And there you have it. The context of these passages is talking about conception. This is what enmity means with regards to the fall. And look at what else we find. Desire, or the carnal mind. Could the two be related? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8 7. Do we need a reminder of what carnal means? Moreover thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife, to defile thyself with her. Leviticus 18.20. The carnal mind begins with desire, which bringeth forth enmity, and when it is finished, conception. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1.15. This is where we are at. The human race is in big, big trouble. Cursed is the ground. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.17. Along with our newly corrupted DNA, comes our corrupted universe. This is the moment of the Big Bang. This is when our three-dimensional existence as we know, it came to be. As beautiful as our universe may be, the Bible reminds us that this is merely a shadow of the original creation, not the creation itself. Again, we exist in corruption. A perpetual fallen state complete with entropy and death. Two women, two trees. Because the fall of man is such an important subject, we will now dedicate a portion of this presentation to study this in more detail. Thus, in order to truly understand what happened in the Garden of Eden, we must learn more about the two trees, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. According to scripture, these two trees represent many things. And, as we learned earlier, understanding the Bible is like putting puzzle pieces together. Once one does this, surprising and even shocking revelations appear. This study will be a prime example of this. We will begin by suggesting that these two trees are, among other things, a representation of two women. You have probably heard of them. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation 12.1. The woman of the apocalypse represents the tree of life. She has an opposite. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation 17.5. The mystery harlot represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both women of course may be found in the book of Revelation. These two women represent other things as well two witnesses. A heavenly witness and an earthly witness. A heavenly covenant and an earthly covenant. Wisdom and folly. The virtuous woman and the strange woman. Truth and deception. Holy ghost and familiar spirit. Dove and serpent. Freedom and bondage. Saved and unsaved. Christ and antichrist. Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. Isaac and Ishmael. And, if one is willing to receive it, heavenly Jerusalem and earthly Jerusalem. Yes, it would appear that all of the verses pertaining to mystery Babylon point to an earthly Jerusalem. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Revelation 11:8. The great city mentioned here is mystery Babylon. And since we know Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, we have an open and shut case for where this great city is located. According to scripture, 
Mystery Babylon is Jerusalem. So, is the mystery of Babylon finally solved? Not so fast. Let us examine that verse a little more carefully. Which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Revelation 11:8. This verse is going out of its way to tell us that this great city, where Jesus was crucified, is not meant to be taken literally. There is a spiritual concept involved here, meaning the answer is not as obvious as one would assume. We all know that modern-day Jerusalem is not located in Egypt, nor is it called Sodom. There is a deeper meaning here that we must uncover. We know from the Bible that Sodom represents corruption and Egypt represents bondage. Thus, there is something about this so-called Jerusalem that has to do with corruption and being in bondage. What if this spiritual meaning had more to do with our corrupted flesh and less to do with a piece of real estate? What if the Jerusalem being hinted at is really just a name that God gave our current genetic makeup, our corrupt DNA in which we are held bondage? More specifically, what if Jerusalem represents the mother that gave birth to the entire human race? The father being Satan as we learned previously. And in her was found the blood of prophets, and of saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 18:24. Note that all means all. Every man, woman, and child that has ever lived is living now, and will ever live, she drank their blood. If we take this literally, then that would mean that the harlot was drinking the blood of humans since the beginning, when Adam and Eve had their first child. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Genesis 4:1. Gaia, Mother Earth, drank the blood of Abel. Thus, Mystery Babylon, that great city also represents Earth. The seven mountains in which she sits are the seven continents. Mystery Babylon is none other than the entire planet, if not the universe as well, the mother of all harlots and abominations. The mother of our corrupt DNA that holds all of us in bondage. Remember what David said? My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Psalm 139:15. The earth and hell is our mother. This bears repeating, the earth and hell is our mother. But why call her Jerusalem? Obviously, the city of Jerusalem was not around when Cain killed Abel. Why is God placing the blood of all who were slain on Jerusalem's head? The answer is given to us in Matthew 23, 35. That upon you Jerusalem may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Matthew 23, 35. In this extremely profound verse, the sum total of all the blood, or rather DNA, that mystery Babylon drank, gets ascribed to an entity called Jerusalem. So, although earth, Gaia, mystery Babylon, drank the blood of Abel, Jerusalem is now the one who is ultimately held responsible. But why? Why should Jerusalem be held accountable for all of mankind's corruption going back to Abel? Is God an anti-Semite? Of course not. Again, we need to understand what the word Jerusalem truly means in the grand scheme of things. Notice the words blood or DNA with regards to the temple. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation, Matthew 23, 36. Do you see it yet? Jerusalem represents a generation. In other words, earthly Jerusalem represents the mother of the genetic construct of all life on earth. When Jesus spoke of a den of vipers, he was specifically referring to our very DNA. Does this sound crazy? Too far out? Ask yourself. What is it about Jerusalem that represents the genetics of all humans on this planet? You should know the answer by now. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3 16-17. 
Jerusalem ultimately represents the temple. The human body. My body, your body, everyone's body. In fact, we are about to learn how the tabernacle in the wilderness was a perfect representation of a eukaryotic cell. The same type of biological cell that makes up humans and all animal life. Do you understand what is being taught here? For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known, 1 Corinthians 13 12. Mystery Babylon is us. All of us. The entire corrupt human race. When one takes a sober and honest look into the mirror darkly, one will see the truth. But wait, there is good news. A salvation plan is in the works. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 2. The harlot, in other words, you and I, gets cleaned up in order to become the bride of Christ. We become born again. Literally, physically, and spiritually. Our tabernacle, our earthly Jerusalem body, gets an upgrade. Tabernacle Cell Biology The discovery that is just now spreading across the globe is how the tabernacle in the wilderness is a perfect representation of a eukaryotic cell. The same cells that we humans and all animal life have. Why something this obvious has been kept hidden for so long is a bit of a mystery. Basically, when one studies the descriptions and functions of the components that make up the tabernacle, one finds that each component functions exactly the same as their counterparts in an actual biological cell. For example, any biologist will tell you that the Golgi apparatus, the organelle designed to package proteins, resembles a stack of pita bread. In the tabernacle, the table of shoe bread resembles a stack of pita bread as well. Mitochondrial DNA matches precisely with the candlestick, right down to the branches and flowers. The most incredible similarity, however, is how the nucleolus of a cell matches precisely with the Ark of the Covenant. The match is so spot on that some researchers have discovered actual gene sequences encoded within the pages of the Bible. By comparing verses to known genetic algorithms, this occult genetic code may one day be developed into a living being, if it is not already. Why would God reveal this to us? What purpose does it serve? One thing is for certain, bioengineers across the globe are wasting no time experimenting, attempting to manifest their future messiah. With or without God's approval. What was the harlot arrayed in? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Revelation 17 4. The harlot was arrayed in purple and scarlet, the same materials used throughout the tabernacle and in the high priest's garments. And every occultist knows that the golden chalice represents the womb. What was in her womb? Genetic abominations. Where does the abomination of desolation sit? When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Matthew 24 15. The holy place of the temple body. The biological cell. Unfortunately, the world is still blind to this. Especially those that have yet to recognize the New Testament. The ones that should have seen the obvious long ago. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23 37 through 39. The phrase, your house, and desolate, has to do with the womb and childbearing. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. 
Galatians 4:27. The word desolate can mean one who is unable to bear children. Revelation is not a prophecy of simply terminating a physical city in Israel. No. When mystery Babylon is destroyed, the entire planet is destroyed. God is about to exterminate the human race. The human genome. The human earthly Jerusalem DNA template. Is there a replacement set of genetics? Of course. Blood got us into this mess, and blood will get us out. The blood of Jesus is our salvation. His genetic template is going to rescue us. Where was our Lord crucified? And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Acts 10:39. Jesus was hung in Jerusalem on the tree of the chromosome in the great city of cell biology and the kingdom of God within. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Revelation 11:4. The two witnesses represent chromatids. When one compares the description of the two olive trees in Zechariah to a chromosome, the match is stunningly precise. And it all goes back to the two mothers. The two trees. The two witnesses. The two genetic constructs in the Garden of Eden. And a forbidden fruit. A forbidden fruit of blood. The woman of the apocalypse. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation 12 1. The woman of the apocalypse represents the mother of the new genetic construct that our glorified bodies will be made from. The man-child she gives birth to represents an entire nation called Israel. The word Israel is the biblical code name for this new genetic construct. Jacob, the worm, represents the new RNA strand we will be grafted into. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Romans 11:23. This and many other verses like it are a very clear and very literal way of describing gene splicing. Not just any gene splicing, but a spiritual form of it. And I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 2. And just as earthly Jerusalem represents earthly genetics, New Jerusalem represents heavenly genetics. Those familiar with higher dimensions will recognize that the description of New Jerusalem resembles a tesseract. And just as a fourth dimensional tesseract casts a three dimensional shadow, New Jerusalem casts a three-dimensional shadow as well. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee in the mount. Hebrews 8 5. The tabernacle in the wilderness is a three-dimensional shadow of New Jerusalem. In other words, the heavenly biological cell casts an earthly biological cell shadow. It is as if they are linked somehow in a type of quantum entanglement. Two Mothers, Two Covenants If one were to choose two women in the Bible that would best represent the two women of Revelation, it would be Sarah and Hagar. Sarah represents the tree of life and New Jerusalem. Hagar represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Jerusalem which now is. In other words, earthly Jerusalem. Two mothers, two trees, two covenants, two genetic constructs. One being an earthly shadow of the heavenly. If we were to compare planetary bodies to Sarah and Hagar, currently, Sarah would represent the moon. She is the barren woman. She longs to bear children, yet every month, every moon cycle, she is reminded once again, that no fruit is yet on the vine. Hagar would represent earth, Gaia, mystery Babylon who laughs and mocks the moon with its barren, unfruitful landscape. Hagar is fruitful and the mother of many nations. However, one day the tide will turn. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, 
thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Galatians 4:27. She that hath an husband is Hagar. Her husband is Abraham, whom Sarah gave, in order to be fruitful. But now it is Sarah's turn. Sarah and Abraham are about to give birth to the new genetic construct called Israel. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians 4:26. Did you know you had a mother in heaven? No, not the queen of heaven, or Mary. New Jerusalem. Note the play on words. She is above, as in heaven, yet she is the moon, which is also above. If we keep reading Galatians, we find that not only are Hagar and Sarah representative of earthly Jerusalem and heavenly Jerusalem, but also the Old Testament and New Testament. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Galatians 4.25. Notice the word gendereth. As we have already learned, Jerusalem, which now is as, corresponds to our temple body. Our current genetic construct, that is in bondage. We are bound by the laws of physics of this universe. We are for all intents and purposes, in prison. For this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Galatians 4.25. Jerusalem which now is, corresponds to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Its exact location is still uncertain. Some folks believe Mount Sinai is in Arabia, since Galatians 4.25 uses the word Arabia. However, a more logical interpretation suggests that the word Arabia is referring to the language in which the name Agar comes from. In other words, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabic language. Agar in Arabic means rock or stone. This would make much more sense in the context of everything that was going on in Exodus. For example, the word Jerusalem means chief cornerstone of the evening and morning star. This is fascinating to think about, since both Jesus and Lucifer are called morning star. Thus the chief cornerstone of earthly Jerusalem would be Lucifer, while the chief cornerstone of heavenly Jerusalem would be Jesus. Note also that Hagar gave birth to the Arabs and the Muslim religion. And what do we see them worshipping? A chief cornerstone embedded into a counterfeit New Jerusalem. Something very profound is happening here. This chief cornerstone is called Hajar Aswad, or Black Stone. The word Hajar is the Arabic word for Hagar. Arabs call Hagar, City Hajar, or Mother Hagar. She is one of the most revered women figures in Islam. Note that the Hagar stone sits in a housing shaped like a yoni, or female genitalia. Some believe the stone is a meteorite. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how, that the city of the Ephesians, is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Acts 19.35. Diana is another name for mystery Babylon and the worship of the female reproductive system. Imagine the Kaaba cube shown here is Hagar. The silver housing in the corner is her yoni. The chief cornerstone inside would therefore be the male seat entering into it. Yes. That is what chief cornerstone means. Male seed. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2.35. Jesus of course is the true chief cornerstone. This seed will one day become a mountain that will fertilize and fill the new earth. The new earth being an extension of Sarah. Now Sarai Abram's wife bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Genesis 16:1. Remember, Hagar is the Egyptian woman. What scripture is teaching us in a subtle way is that Hagar represents Hather the golden calf of Exodus who later became Isis, and whose symbol again represents the female reproductive system. The word Hather is made up of two parts. Hat means mansion, or more specifically, womb. Har means Horus. Thus, Hather means womb of Horus, literally. 
Depictions of Hather such as the one being shown here are not depicting a human face. What we are in fact looking at is a uterus disguised as a half-human, half-cow hybrid. Her ears represent ovaries. Here, we can see the seed of the woman, surrounded by sun rays of the male seed. It is a picture of conception. This is why Aaron created the golden calf specifically from earrings. The Israelites were worshipping the female reproductive system. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Proverbs 5.3. If Hather, the strange woman, represents the womb, what do you suppose her mouth is? Sometimes scripture has a way of explaining things that adults need to confront in a mature manner. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Proverbs 23:27. The strange woman is the pit where earthly life is born from. Think of Revelation and the bottomless pit in which strange hybrid life forms appear out of. Now, it is important to note that the pit is not always the strange woman and harlot. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Isaiah 51:1. What is the rock, and what is the pit? Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Isaiah 51:2. Abraham is the rock representing the incorruptible seed of Christ. Sarah is the pit, representing New Jerusalem, the mother of us all. Hather and Mount Sinai The exact location of Mount Sinai is still a mystery to this day. Let us take a look at a proposed location that is rarely talked about, Sarabit el Kadam, an ancient mining site known for its temple of Hather. Yes, as incredible as this may sound, some folks believe that Mount Sinai may have been at the Temple of Hather, the golden calf the Israelites worshipped in the wilderness. Moses, being an Egyptian elite, would have surely known of this temple, high on top of a mountain peak in the Sinai Peninsula, where turquoise was often mined. Because the site was often unoccupied for long periods of time, this Temple of Hather would have made a perfect refuge and research and development lab for Moses as he worked with God on the blueprints for a future tabernacle. Other locations have been proposed for Mount Sinai, but they all have the same thing in common. There is literally nothing at the top of these mountains for a man to survive. Why put Moses on top of a barren mountain peak with no food, shelter, water or even tools to carve a tablet with, much less a new tabernacle? The Temple of Hather most likely would have had provisions stored for future miners and tools to carve new idols to the goddess. Everything Moses would have needed to build a new tabernacle. In fact, carved tablets found at the site look remarkably like typical renditions of something the Ten Commandments would be carved upon. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was shewed thee in the mount. Exodus 25 40. If it turns out, that the tabernacle in the wilderness truly was a model of a eukaryotic cell, then Moses was shown patterns or blueprints of cell biology on Mount Sinai. Cell biology that seemed to have everything to do with Hather, Isis, the mother goddess of the Egyptians. Note that the temple's sister site, Dendera, seems to contain blueprints as well. Carvings of RNA strands trapped inside of incubating chambers reminiscent of sci-fi movies such as The Matrix cover the walls. Everything in this world boils down to genetics. The one who holds the keys to the genetic code holds the universe. The Egyptians knew many of these secrets, and their attempts at becoming gods are legendary. The world's oldest Mazareth, or Zodiac, may be found at Dendera as well. The Sinai area was the center of moon worship. Hather, the sycamore fig tree. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3:6. Another name for Hather was 
the lady of the sycamore fig tree. This was when she was in the form of a tree. And as the name suggests, her fruit was the sycamore fig. Fig consumption was equated with eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Hather herself. Since tomb paintings often show Hather leaning down from the tree to pour out wine and offer bread to souls in the afterlife, an analogy with the Catholic communion sacrament might be appropriate. Hather would offer her fruit called the drink of the instantaneous no in order to make one wise. Sound familiar? And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Genesis 3 7. Since the leaves of Hather's tree are representative of flesh, what we see here is Adam and Isha trying to create bodies for themselves using the genetics of Hather. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Galatians 3.13. Legend has it that the spirits of the dead hang on Hather's tree. It was the desire of all devout Egyptians, from Middle Kingdom times forward, to join Hather in her tree after death, to have their ba souls perch themselves there among the gods. Lake of Fire And whosoever was not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the Lake of Fire. Revelation 2015. The modern church teaches that the Lake of Fire is the end of the story and that those who are thrown into it are doomed for all eternity. Some denominations believe these unfortunate souls burn forever, while others believe they are completely annihilated. Neither of these are true however. Once again, the Word of God will teach us what really happens to those that are thrown in. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. 2 Kings 23.10 in addition to the flaming sard and cherubim in the Garden of Eden in which Adam and Eve passed through, there is another Old Testament topology of the Lake of Fire. The Valley of the Sun, or Children of Hinnom is where they sacrifice children to an entity called Moloch. As we learned previously, Moloch is simply another version of the Golden Calf, representing the womb of reincarnation. One important piece of information here is that the Bible goes out of its way several times to highlight the fact that the children pass through the fire. In other words, they do not burn forever. What this ultimately means is that the lake of fire is merely a portal. Those that are tossed in are given another chance at life. Is there more proof of this? Yes? Look at the word topheth. Topheth is another term that is used for the lake of fire. The original meaning of this word is still a mystery and topic of debate, however, with a bit of research, we can solve this riddle once and for all. Tophet is associated with a goddess called Tanit. She is another version of Astard and Hather. Her symbol is the star and crescent which later became associated with Islam. Biblically, Tanit would thus be represented by Hagar the bondwoman. Note that another symbol of Tanit looks very much like an Egyptian ankh. When added together, this evidence once again points directly to reincarnation and being born again under the law, an Old Testament bondage of Hagar. Let's look at another verse. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared, he hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood, the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Isaiah 30 33. Here we see the word tophet being used once again to describe the lake of fire in the Old Testament. This is the King James translation. When we look at the JPS Tanic translation, we see that the word tophet is translated as hearth. This is the key to discovering what exactly the lake of fire is all about. The word hearth is in fact a reference to a goddess. More specifically, the goddess of the eternal flame. Her name is Hestia. Hestia comes to us from the ancient Greek religion. According to Wikipedia, Hestia received the first offering at every sacrifice in the household. You heard that right. Hestia received sacrifices. And guess what? 
Hestia's brother is none other than Hades. Yes, Hades as in hell in the underworld. The word Hades is found ten times in the New Testament. This is very strong evidence that the word Tophet may indeed be a reference to Hestia and Hades. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude 1 7. Here is where things get very interesting. The Roman equivalent to Hestia is Vesta. You may have heard of the Vestal Virgins, whose job it was to keep the eternal fire perpetually burning. That is correct, eternal fire as in Tophet, the lake of fire. On page 569 of this Hebrew and English lexicon, we see that the author indeed associates Vesta with Tophet and the lake of fire. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out, Leviticus 6.13. The concept of eternal fire can be found with regards to the tabernacles and temples of the Old Testament. And just like Hestia and Vesta, these perpetual flames are used for sacrifice. The connections are undeniable. And if that were not enough, we have yet another piece of evidence connecting Vesta to the lake of fire and the portal to reincarnation. Vesta's image, it turns out, is almost never depicted in art. Why? because it is too obscene. The manifestation of Vesta is literally the moment of conception. A flaming phallus or fascinus, impregnating a womb. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the biggest secrets the church is keeping from the world today. Those tossed into the lake of fire pass through the passion flames of Vesta and are immediately conceived into another corrupt human body. The mystery of iniquity, reincarnation, is complete. Occultists have known about the link between reincarnation and the lake of fire for quite some time, although it is generally kept very secret. This image is from a book entitled, The Hermetical Triumph. It was created in the early 1700s and is highly alchemical in nature. When we compare the symbols shown to human anatomy and scripture, something incredible happens. A great mystery is revealed before our very eyes. The great cave of metals remains hidden. It is the stone of the venerable Hermes. Reads the engraving. The entire piece is an occulted diagram of a uterus during the moment of conception. At the bottom there is a lake burning with fire representing the yoni. The two caves, or sides of the pit, represent the ovaries. This is all a picture of reincarnation with an emphasis on the child becoming a great king or ruler. Perhaps even the Antichrist. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Act 741. There was a very brave gentleman in the Bible by the name of Stephen who was full of power and wisdom. When challenged, Stephen began revealing great truths regarding just what exactly the golden calf symbolized. Not only was the golden calf an idol that sacrifices were made to, but it also represented another deity that sacrifices were made to. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Act 743. What Stephen had revealed was that Moloch was simply another representation of Hather, the golden calf. As we learned earlier, those thrown into the lake of fire passed through to Moloch, or the womb of a new earthly mother and reincarnation. Further evidence of this is revealed to us by the somewhat cryptic phrase, the star of Remphan. In scripture, stars are not just representative of angels, but children as well. A falling star then, would be a fallen angel that is about to become reincarnated on earth as a child once again. Since most scholars agree that Remphan is the god Saturn, we can deduce, that the star of Remphan means the child of Saturn. Who is the child of Saturn? In Roman mythology, Saturn had many children such as Jupiter and Neptune. In the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hull, there is the legend of the Satic Isis, who claims to be the eldest daughter of Saturn. Isis as we already know, is Hather. 
Could Hathor be disguising herself as the eldest daughter of Saturn? And just who is the eldest daughter of Saturn anyhow? Vesta. Yes, Vesta is the eldest daughter of Saturn. The star child of Remphan. Vesta is also known as June. When Stephen revealed these incredible connections, he was immediately stoned to death. Ariel. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. Isaiah 29 2. Another incredible link between the lake of fire, the eternal flame of the hearth, and the garden of Eden, can be found in the word Ariel. The word Ari can mean either lion or lioness, while the word El means God. Many scholars believe the word Ariel should be understood as lioness of God. The word Ariel in the Bible has three different Strong's numbers assigned to it. Each one has a distinct definition and meaning. Strong's number 739 refers to hybrid beings that are part human and part lion. Note that verses in the Bible often depict lions and lionesses as fierce and bloodthirsty. Strong's number 740 refers to earthly Jerusalem, also known as Mystery Babylon. Strong's number 741 refers to the brazen altar of sacrifice found in the Jerusalem temples. When we look closely at these three unique definitions for the word Ariel, an interesting picture develops. In Isaiah 29 2, both instances of the word Ariel use Strong's 740, however, there seems to be a play on words here. The first instance of Ariel refers to earthly Jerusalem. In other words, something terrible is about to happen to that great city. This same word is also meant to convey the idea that earthly Jerusalem is playing the part of a bloodthirsty being that is part lioness and part human. Previously, we learned that Mystery Babylon represents the Earth Mother, Hather. However, Hather is a golden calf. Why would Hather be depicted as a bloodthirsty lioness? Because Hather has another form called Sekhmet, the warrior goddess. Sekhmet is one of Hather's alter egos who is known for breathing fire. Think of the Lake of Fire. Sekhmet is also known for being very bloodthirsty. In fact, Sekhmet's blood lust was so great, Ra had to trick her into drinking beer made to resemble blood. Mistaking the beer for blood, Sekhmet became so drunk that she finally gave up and became peaceful. Does this story sound familiar? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, Revelation 17:6. Yes, Mystery Babylon is drunken and bloodthirsty. A perfect match for Hather's evil side. The second instance of the word Ariel has to do with Vesta, the eternal flame of the hearth. More specifically, the altar hearth of the Jerusalem temple often called the altar of sacrifice. And although this altar was never meant for human sacrifice, the context of Isaiah 29-2 actually refers to the altar in this manner. Thus, when we add up all of the evidence, the word Ariel refers to Sekhmet, Hather, Malach, Mystery Babylon, the Brazen Altar, Tophet, Vesta the Hearth Goddess, and the Lake of Fire. Some have even linked the word Ariel to the underworld. And if that was not enough, in Jewish and Christian mysticism and apocrypha, Ariel is an archangel. The 1899 Encyclopedia Biblica suggests, that the word Ariel should be understood as Uriel. Who is Archangel Uriel? Uriel is said to be the one who wields the flaming sword in the Garden of Eden. Thus, Uriel too represents the altar of human sacrifice and top head. What this means is that Adam and Eve really did pass through the lake of fire to be reincarnated on earth. If we now look at the lake of fire and compare it to the flaming sword of the Garden of Eden, we find that they are both portals. The other end of these portals lead to the tabernacle in the wilderness. The human egg cell where life begins. The two cherubim and flaming sword are represented by the Ark of the Covenant. Let's not forget the fact that Lucifer is said to be the anointed cherub, 
that covers the ark. There's that seed of the serpent again. And say, what is thy mother? A lioness, she lay down among lions, she nourished her whelps among young lions. Ezekiel 19 2. The mother lioness being referred to here is earthly Jerusalem. Again, we see a connection between mystery Babylon and Sekhmet. This lioness would eventually go on to raise several cubs that would become wicked leaders. These wicked leaders would meet their demise by being captured and thrown into the pit. In a remarkable passage we will begin to cover in more detail, the lioness is compared to DNA or vine in the blood. This leads us back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the source of our corrupt genetics. Blood of the Forbidden Fruit He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. John 6 56. When Jesus spoke those words, so many followers were offended by it, they stopped following and never looked back. What Jesus was trying to explain was very profound for those days, however, today we take it for granted. Basically, flesh or the food we eat is DNA, the Word of God. We tend to think of flesh as human or animal flesh, not realizing that fruit has flesh as well. Fruit also has blood. Jesus was referring to the tree of life and the twelve manner of fruit that would heal the nations one day. Essentially, by eating this fruit, one's very DNA will change. This is the body of glory and life. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Deuteronomy 32:33. The opposite of the blood of Jesus is the blood of the forbidden fruit. Consuming this gives one a body of corruption and death. Thus, the forbidden fruit contains blood, or rather, corrupt genetics, with Satan as the father and Hather, mystery Babylon, as the mother. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood, planted by the waters, she was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. Ezekiel 19.10. Notice scripture is comparing the vine in the blood or DNA to a mother tree. Note that mitochondrial DNA, represented by the candlestick in the tabernacle and temple, is passed down by the mother. This is the lioness we learned about previously. And she had strong rods for the scepters of them that bear rule, and her stature was exalted among the thick branches, and she appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches. Ezekiel 19:11. Sounds like a mighty impressive tree. But she was plucked up in fury, she was cast down to the ground, and the east wind dried up her fruit, her strong rods were broken and withered, the fire consumed them. Ezekiel 19:12. This tall and mighty tree was cast down to the ground. What happened? Pride? Corruption? There was something about this genetic template that God did not like. That is because this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For thousands of years now, researchers have tried their best to discover just what exactly was the forbidden fruit. Sometimes when studying scripture, it helps to look at opposites for contrast. The opposite to the tree of knowledge is the tree of life. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22:2. In this verse, we can clearly see that, like the tree of knowledge, the tree of life is also a woman. And she bears twelve manner of fruit. But look carefully. She bears fruit every month. In other words, the tree of life has a monthly cycle. What the Word of God is teaching us here in a subtle manner is that her fruit, her seed, is a representation of an avum. This is why the woman of the apocalypse is standing on the moon. The moon is another representation of the seed of the woman. She has dominion over it. In contrast stands the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Hagar the Egyptian woman. Again, a representation of Hather the golden calf and mystery Babylon. Her forbidden fruit is also the avum. And there we have it. The forbidden fruit is the Orphic egg from which the human race originated from. Not just an egg by itself, however, but a fertilized egg. 
In order for conception to take place, an egg must be fertilized. This is where the seed of the serpent comes in. Both seed of the serpent and seed of the woman were combined in order to produce the forbidden fruit. Once this occurred, the only thing that was missing was for a spirit and soul to enter into it and produce life. By eating of the forbidden fruit, Adam and Isha became the spirits and souls that entered into the fertilized egg and thus became born again, not of incorruptible flesh, but of corruptible. By the way, this is the same way we all became born again into this world. We all partook of the forbidden fruit of our earthly mother. Another way to look at it is that God gave Adam and Isha a choice of which parents they would like to be birthed from. They chose Mystery Babylon as their earthly mom and Satan as their earthly father. So did we. What was in the hand of Mystery Babylon? Filthiness of her fornication. Meditate on that for a moment. Disgusting, right? Yet that is precisely what the forbidden fruit was. And everyone has partaken of it. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Jeremiah 51 7. Imagine how mad folks will be when they finally realize what has happened to them. They drank of that hot mess in order to be reincarnated. Speaking of going mad. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Revelation 17 16. What a fascinating dichotomy this is. The beast hates his wife mother, and yet they still eat her flesh. They eat the flesh and drink the blood of Hather, in order to come back into the corrupt world they made for themselves, and yet they burn her. It is a love-hate relationship apparently. Oh, and let us not forget the punchline in all of this. Remember, one cannot have a new heavenly Jerusalem without an old earthly Jerusalem. Have you ever noticed that mystery Babylon is never thrown into the lake of fire? That is because God ultimately saves her in the end. You heard that correctly. Mystery Babylon, aka, earthly Jerusalem, is ultimately resurrected, cleaned up, and made ready by being given a new glorified body. Mystery Babylon becomes born again. And to her was granted, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Revelation 19.8. Incredible, isn't it? Yet that is how powerful the love of God is. That same salvation is available to everyone. If God can save Mystery Babylon, then surely, he can save any one of us. Amen? There is a great lesson to be learned here regarding who one hates and who one criticizes in this world, it could be one's very own mother. Have you been a little too harsh on Mystery Babylon lately? Perhaps a bit of gratitude is in order here. The Marriage Supper Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19:7. The harlot has been forgiven. She is now in her new glorified body. Her new name is Sarah. Our Heavenly Mother is now ready to give birth to the new genetic construct called Israel, in which all will be grafted into. In order to do this, Sarah needs a husband. Abraham represents God the Father. Abraham's bosom is where the saved rest until they can enter Sarah's womb via her pearly gates and partake of her tree of life. Once this occurs, they too will be born again into the new glorified body. Again, the tree of life is where the heavenly avum is produced in a monthly cycle, or period. This is the seed of the woman. And he shewed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation 22 1. Instead of the seed of the serpent, we now have the chief cornerstone, or blood of the Lamb. This is the seed of Abraham, the rock that fertilizes Sarah's tree of life, via the river of life. Both combine to produce the fertilized egg. The saved are the spirits and souls that partake of this fruit in order to become born again. The marriage is now consummated.
This is the opposite of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And now, instead of a covering of Hather's fig leaves, the saved have a covering of Sarah's healing leaves. The mystery of godliness is complete. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22 2. And there we have it. The adult education you were never taught in Sunday school. The longer Satan can keep this information from the masses, the more souls he can trap in the reincarnation cycle. It is time to wake up Christians. You need to come clean now and tell the truth about hell and the lake of fire. God is love. God is merciful. His creation is given as many chances as it takes to get it right. It is a choice that is given to us as a gift. Please, stop hiding this from everyone. Look into your hearts. Do you despise this message? Let go of the hatred that is keeping you in bondage. Forgive. Love, be content, and at peace. Thank you for taking the time to consider this information. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Please share this freely. God bless.